Good morning. It's good to see you. We'd like to begin our service with a song, number 63 in your hymnal. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Let's stand as we sing this together. It's number 63 in our hymnal. sing that last verse in a moment, but while the instruments play, feel free, move about, give someone a warm greeting this morning.
let's go ahead and sing that last verse, Great Father of Glory, all together. Great Father of As we begin our service this morning, let me just uh, comment on the wonderful nature of our church family camp this past Wednesday afternoon through yesterday afternoon. It's amazing how something that is so enjoyable can leave you a little on the tired side. And uh, I don't know how the Van Gelderers keep doing camp and evangelistic meetings week after week and never get tired. Probably I'd get another introduction to that this morning here for your message. That's good. We're going to begin with prayer. Before I do, uh, there are two Razor scooters over by the church office. I think the secretaries will pass on using those. So if they belong to one of your kids um, from camp, feel free to pick those up. I want to pray for Pastor Macon, who's been ill for the last... Uh, much of this past week, and then I um, want to pray for uh, Sandra, who's here this morning. She continues to recover, as do others, from recent surgeries, and uh, let's begin with prayer. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us um, this past week. Lord, the messages, the music, the fellowship, Lord, the activities that knit hearts together and families together and we do thank you for that which we've been able to experience. Lord, we do think of several this morning that just need your special help. We do pray for Pastor Macon. You'd continue to renew his strength. Thank you, Lord, for those who've recently had surgeries, for Larry Turner, Dina Powers, Heather Elstad, and um, Sandra. Lord, continue to strengthen her. Thank you that she's able to to drive again and, and making some progress. And then, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with our service this morning. Lord, work in our hearts, meet every need. And, Lord, may we look to you in all things. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our next song asks a question, will Jesus find us watching? That's 274 right there in front of you. 274 in our hymnal, Will Jesus Find Us Watching?
Yeah, we'd like to sing one more at this time. Um, it is number 371 in our hymnal, A Passion for Thee. Let's stand as we sing this together, please. Number 371. the offering let me remind us of that opportunity this morning and this evening to designate toward the love offering for the Van Gelderen family let's bow for prayer as we're led as we bring our tithes and offerings to you we pray that you would bless them that they would be used to shed the light that it would disperse the darkness that your name would be glorified with, with our testimony and with what you do through us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Just before our regular announcements, I had one thing that came up last week that I wanted to to help us with as a church church body. As as last week, we heard something from uh, Brother Van Geldren, so I'd like him to come up here so I can present him with something that he might actually already start to think about as he's mentioned it several times. Here we have a certificate of associate church membership presented to uh, Brother Van Geldren, and uh, so that is for you. Uh, you know, it's mentioned many times that uh, I had that. Uh, I don't know if that'll fit in your luggage, yeah, so we have, we have here one that, that's luggage size. Okay, well, thank um, you. And, and, and what goes along with that, I wanted to make sure that one of our church members did mention, make sure to get him some offering envelopes. Okay, there we go. <laughs> That's the first. Give to your own love offering. So a couple of other quick announcements. Before another special announcement, we have uh, a school year starting here in a few short weeks, actually, because tomorrow is August 1st. If you can help toward the scholarship fund, it would be much needed and greatly appreciated. And college and career, remember, if you would, your activity coming up on uh, Saturday, I think, isn't it? August uh, 6th, so uh, that'll be this coming Saturday. And then this coming Sunday, uh, evening after the evening service, uh, Titus and Jennifer Dameron Hall will be with us for a time of celebration fellowship. Their wedding is on Friday, and they're going to get out our way by Sunday evening. So that'll be a special time for us. And now. So you get two Olsons for the price of one today. <laughs> anyway, I'm delighted to be able to uh, uh, announce and uh, tell you a little bit about another uh, awesome uh, event on the, the church calendar for uh, for our members and uh, that will be the the you know we we call it the Westgate Open we've had that for a number of years and and uh, I, 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 this is all I didn't plan to say this but I'm going to say it pastor handed me a box so could you help me out with organizing this thing and he gave me this big box white box and it said on the end of it golf stuff so I went through there and opened it up, things back from 2007 and 2015 and all these different things. And we found out that it was often called the, fill in the blank, 17th, 18th, 19th annual Westgate Open. And given the fact that we've gone a few years without it, COVID and other things, uh, we, we were struggling for what, you know, it's not annual for number one. And number two, we're not even sure what number it is anymore. So, so we've assembled um, a, a planning committee that's, that's, that's packed full of Jaquits. We got Mike, we got Adrian, we got Jared, and, uh, and I are on our planning committee. And so we, we said, well, for one year only, we're going to stray away from that open thing and we'll, we'll get back to it. Uh, why? Because this is also a, an exciting year and a special year, a milestone year in our church as we will be celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. So I'd like to begin by unveiling uh, kind of our logo this year. It will be called the Westgate 40th Anniversary Golf Tournament. And so I'm, I'd like to explain to you a little bit around what that's going to be about and uh, and uh, so on, let's get on with it. So it will be at the Evergreen Golf Course, uh, the same place we've done it for the last several years, and it's an awesome place. I was out there on Monday of this week, and I met with Jeremy Redding, the owner of the course, and these are photos I took on Monday. The course is in excellent shape. Green, green, it was quite, you know, just very, very nice. So uh, let me uh, advance and keep on my script here. So that'll be on September 10th. Only a little more than a month away. That must be five, maybe six weekends away. Not very far. Um, we'll gather there at 1 o'clock. And uh, at 1 o'clock, um, we'll have the check-in and some, some pre-event activities. In fact, we're going to, you know, we're going to do it up special this year. We're going to have, you know, some kind of things that we'll be able to give out at the very beginning of the things. If you show up, as you, you join us, and more about all those things a little bit later. Uh, but nonetheless, there'll be some things that, to commemorate the event as well. Um, and so we, we ask you to be there if you're going to join us at 1 o'clock because uh, there'll be some, some instructions and things. And, and uh, as you might have noticed there, 
the, the starting is a shotgun starting at 2 o'clock. That, that means if you're not in the place at 2 o'clock, the guy with the shotgun's coming to look for you. So you'll, you'll want to you'll wanna, you'll wanna be in, in a place. Uh, actually, you know, I was thinking about it and some of the, the things that go on between 1 and 2, and because we spread out the whole course, you, you know, you need time. If you're on, like, hole 5, you need some time to get to hole 5. And a shotgun start is literally into the air so people can hear it all and we'll all start playing at the same time that helps the tournament to go smoothly but come early we'll have some refreshments we'll have a, a time of fellowship there'll be an opportunity to warm up on the putting green as we often do um, and uh, then let's see we have team prizes first of all uh, the team prizes will be for the first second and third place teams generally they're groups of four people um, if you don't have uh, people with you and you're single, you want to play, no problem. We'll put together the teams. If you have others that you want to invite or others that you want to uh, play with, then, then that's awesome. Uh, in addition to the team prizes, we will have some individual prizes. Uh, there'll be a ladies and a men's long drive. That on a specific hole, if you get the longest drive, there'll be prizes. There'll be good prizes. Um, and uh, you, under Mike uh, Jaquist's leadership, we're going to continue to go out and meet with local vendors and other things to see whether they'd like to sponsor uh, in exchange for some good advertising to our congregation. And so there'll be a, a ladies' long drive and a men's long drive. Another one that's quite fun is uh, of individual prices is closest to pin. I don't know why they call it KP, but it's closest to pin. It starts with a C in my book. Uh, but nonetheless, there'll be those as well. Those will be on a par three, where if you have a good shot, you can actually get on to the green in one, for especially the fellas. Ladies will have two strokes to get onto the green, and the closest to the pin there is it will get an individual prize as well. After the game, we'll uh, gather together in the clubhouse there for a meal. We'll have uh, the traditional barbecue, burgers, and, and salads, and, and, and desserts, and things in there. Uh, and that's a special time as well. And we will be uh, visited by and uh, hearing from uh, Brother Mike Schrock. He'll give a, a good um, a salvation message. So it's a great opportunity to reach out to your, uh, maybe you have some friends or acquaintances, work colleagues that you know are golfers, but are, are not uh, believers. It's a great opportunity to have them come in and, and, and experience the event and, and hear the gospel message. So it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to do that. Uh, and we, Mike's been there a number of times. He's great to listen to. And uh, we'll, we'll look for a special blessing there. Um, so the pricing for, for the golf and a barbecue dinner is $36, which is a, is a great price. Um, and uh, if, if there are some of you who say, well, I'd like to you know, just come to the event um, and wouldn't be golfing, that's an option too. You can join the barbecue dinner um, at, at, at $15 plus a gratuity. Those prices are payable when you sign up. Uh, and, uh, and then there's also at the clubhouse um, a number of things that you might need last minute you might have forgot about that you can get there. And they also offer powered golf carts, the prices you see there, a uh, bag, pull cart, and rental clubs, should that be necessary for you, and those can be paid directly to the, to the club on the day of the event. Okay, just one more thing. So if, if that was not enough to, you know, hat, golf balls, chances for winning some prizes isn't enough, we, we're pulling out all the stops on this one, and we're going to have uh, the opportunity for a prize for the hole in one. And we know those are one in a big number. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of exciting when you stand up at the tee and you're getting ready to swing the ball and you say, hey, this is the prize hole. And the, if anybody pops one into the hole, there'll be a prize of $1,000 for anybody that happened to put it in the hole. And uh, I think this is probably a, a reasonable time for me to mention that uh, most everything that you well, not most. Everything that you saw that you says, well, where's the church budget going to go on all this stuff? Church budget won't be hit at all on any of these things. These were by donations and, and other things, all the prizes and even that one there. So um, don't worry about that. Um, and uh, anyway, lastly, and just kind of wrapping up, 
we will have uh, invitation cards. Those will be out at the Welcome Center afterwards. Uh, and should it be that you say, hey, that, that work colleague or whatever, grab one of those. And it's a great opportunity to hand it to them and they get all the information they need. We will also have the sign-up sheets will be out there. I suspect we have 72 spots that we will be um, filling all those spots this year. So it's a good idea to uh, sign up today and, uh, and enjoy us on that day. Thank you very much. It is a great outreach opportunity, and uh, we want to encourage each of us to be thinking of folks that we could invite, and uh, so it'll be a great time. Some weeks ago, we had uh, a number baptized, and we have one certificate left to award. Aurora, would you like to come up, and, and uh, how about a, how about a I bet if Grandpa came with you or somebody. All right. Yeah. God bless you, Aurora. Grow in the Lord. Good. How many pray for her as God reminds you of her? And Aurora is how old? Yes, 21. She is. Okay, so I hate to always add 10, but uh, it comes so quickly for sure. Well, we're looking forward to singing congregationally again, following our singing, um, the Van Gelderen Trio will be singing, followed by an instrumental. During that instrumental, uh, we'll invite ages four through grade four to make your way back to room 105, and Mrs. Van Gelderen and her daughters will be there to uh, carry out Children's Church today, and we're grateful for them doing that. And again tonight, I believe as well, during the message time, they've been doing that. I, I noticed that they bring a whole suitcase with them just for materials uh, for the children's program, and uh, so they work hard in so many ways on that. Thank you for doing that. Well, let's sing together congregationally as we're led. Number 70, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Let's stand as we sing this. And make it a prayer from you. Number 70.
Amen. Please be seated.
We're going to Galatians chapter number 5. If you have your Bibles, Galatians in chapter number 5. And we're going to be in the book of Galatians now. Here for the balance of our time together through Sunday night. Hope you'll be able to be here tonight because we're doing one of those uh, again. Uh, kind of... Uh, Finishing the message tonight, I'm not sure how long we'll get here. We'll keep an eye on the clock. There's always nice about the Sunday morning, there's a hard wall, okay? So there's a trap door up here. I bet you didn't know it. It's triggered to go off at 12 noon, so uh, so we're okay on that. Uh, but anyway, it's great to, to be here again. And I, of course, many of you are at family camp. It's great to see you again. Of course, others joining us were able to, not able to be there. It's certainly uh, thrilling to have you here this morning as we finish our series on power to change, power to change. And I realize I've thrown a lot of material. I don't expect everybody to get everything, but I do know everybody along your pilgrim's journey, there's something I'm sure God had that uh, can be a help to you right now where you are in your Christian life, and I hope that you are able to articulate that. I encourage you to write it down. Uh, this is what God taught me. This is what I don't want to forget. This is the truth I know I need, and uh, we've been talking about the power to change, the power of love, the power of light, and the power of life. Well, to, the, this morning's kind of intersects with all of those, but we're going to preach on the power of liberty. The power of liberty. I, um, I have a friend of mine, he's 28 years old, uh, or not 28 years old now, but he was 28 years old when he got saved. When he was five years old, his dad walked out of his life, and when his dad walked out of his life, he said every memory of his dad from that point to the time his dad died, he said every memory was painful. He said when his dad came home, he would sometimes just run up to his dad and throw his arms around his leg as a little six, seven-year-old. And he said his dad would push him off. And he said every memory was painful from that point on. He said as a result of his dad leaving, his mom had to go out, get educated, and then get a job. She was rarely around, not because she didn't want to be around, but she couldn't be. He said when he was 12 years old, he said, I began to medicate the pain with marijuana and alcohol. As uh, said, it eventually got into harder things. He said, I gave 10 years of my life to crystal meth. And completely in bondage. He said, at 28 years old, he said, I was on six Oxycontins a day. For those that do not know, that's prescription heroin. It's an abuse of prescription drugs. He said, I was on six Oxycontins a day. And he said, uh, I was a functioning addict. He said, I was making big money in construction. But he said, my functioning was slipping from me. He said, I take several showers a day because I don't understand this. But the Oxycontin would cause his skin to crawl. He takes several showers a day. His sister had gotten saved. Of course, there was an unsaved home. She had gotten saved and, of course, immediately got burdened for her brother. And uh, she didn't know he was a functioning addict, but she knew things weren't right. Most of all, he wasn't a believer. He's going to hell. And so she uh, began to pray for him. One day she just was so burdened for him, she picked up the phone, called him, said, Matthew, I don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. And she said, you need Jesus. You need to get saved. And she preached the gospel to him. And I think basically he hung up on the call. And do you know what he did after he hung up on the call? This may shock you. He got on his knees and asked Jesus Christ to wash his sins away and save him. It's sometimes uh, it's not a, you know, a soul-winning encounter that may not go well. You never know what God's doing on the other side. He fell on his knees, got saved. He prayed his second prayer. You know what his second prayer was? God, if you take away my addictions, I will give you my life. Now, God doesn't always do this this way. I understand that. God has a will for everybody. But at that moment, he was free. He had no cold turkey, no withdrawal, no medical symptoms, nothing. He was absolutely free. And from that day to this, he's now a pastor of the state of Wisconsin. He has not taken drugs. He has not gone through cold turkey. He has not had desire for drugs. He is free. I think all of us would call that the power of liberty. The power of freedom. Now, as freedom-loving Americans, uh, I hope you value your liberty. And all you've got to do is travel a little bit, particularly to countries that aren't as free. And you realize that as Americans, even with all the problems we have, liberty is still something that we have in this country and we ought to value it and certainly ought to fight to keep it. Because certainly liberty as we know it is under assault. But what we're talking about is not necessarily what we might call political liberty. What we are talking about is a spiritual liberty, the power of liberty. Now, what is the power of liberty? The power of liberty is not the liberty to do what you want to do. The power of liberty is the power to do what he wants you to do. Now, let's look at Galatians chapter number 5. I want you to see a couple of verses on liberty. And I want you to understand what we're talking about because we're going to deal with this this morning and this evening. And, and uh, we'll uh, do some things here that hopefully will be a help to you understanding the power of liberty. A lot is said today about Christian liberty. And a lot of what is said about Christian liberty, I don't believe, is biblical. 
You get ever hear messages on Christian liberty, and I've heard some, read some books on it. You almost get the idea Christian liberty is just uh, would be encapsulated in one word, the word permission. I read a book on grace years ago that was a well-known, famous book, and I got the idea that grace was permission. But any book that will give you an idea that grace is permission or that liberty is permission misses it. Grace is not permission, it's power. It's power to do what God wants you to do. And of course, any verse, uh, that book on grace that was so famous, it didn't have one of the key verses on grace in the Bible, that book, uh, that verse in Titus that says, uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, uh, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. And it uh, didn't deal with that particular issue. But we'll, we'll move on to, to what we're talking about, liberty. Now, when we talk about liberty, notice what it says in verse number 1 of Galatians chapter number 5. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And God is basically saying, listen, you need to stay in the freedom you got when you got saved, and don't get entangled with the yoke of bondage, because the Galatian believers had... Now, most of you know that obviously the Galatian, book of Galatians was written to an area, not a town. It's interesting that there's two theories on, the, on the, where, who the Galatian believers were, but I, I take, think most scholars today believe it was Lystra, Iconium, Derby, and uh, Antioch of Pisidia. Those four, you'll find them in the book of Acts. Paul started those churches. That, that Those were the Galatian churches. And after they got saved, and of course, the book of Galatians is written to save people, nine times in the book of Galatians is found the word brethren. So what had happened is these Galatian believers were just that. They were believers. They had gotten saved like anybody gets saved, trusting Jesus to wash their sins away, keep them out of hell, give me eternal life. Boy, they would gotten saved, but here's the problem. They got into what we've come to call the Galatian error in the Christian life. And Paul writes the book of Galatians because he's concerned about this error that people have gotten into. In other words, they've exchanged liberty for bondage. Now, what in the world is the Apostle Paul talking about? Because he's urging them, stand fast in the liberty. When you got saved, you were free, free from sin, free from self. Don't get entangled in the yoke of bondage. Well, what is the yoke of bondage? We're going to come to that in a moment. But uh, before we do, I want you to see another verse here that kind of helps us. Look at verse 18. It says, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, what in the world does that mean? If you let of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Maybe this illustration will help. Maybe you've heard this. I, I've just heard it. It's kind of a general illustration. Uh, here's a lady. She marries a guy, and I'm telling you, she made a mistake. I mean, but, I mean, she's in it now, and the guy is a drill sergeant. You know what I'm talking about? So they get married, and he hands her a list. He said, I want you to get up at this time. I want you to have breakfast cooked by this time, and I want you to do this. On, and she had, he, had a, he had her day scheduled from the top of the morning to the bottom of the evening, every day of her seven-day week. And I'm telling you, after a while, I mean, it was just sheer drudgery. He wasn't kind to her, really didn't exhibit a lot of love to her, but he was very demanding that she keep the schedule. She was far more of a maid than she was a wife. One day, her husband died, and even though she felt a little bit bad about it, she wasn't all that sad about it. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, so uh, she buried her husband, you know, and, and uh, began to just kind of enjoy life again. And, and another guy came along and swept her off her feet, and, and she got married, but this was totally different. Boy, he loved her, and he spoiled her, and he expressed his love uh, from time to time, and he listened to her, and everything she thought. Uh, I mean, she just was absolutely enjoying marriage. Uh, she had gone on for uh, several months and just enjoying the marriage. And one day she came across the old list. And you know what she found on that old list? She was doing everything on the old list in this new marriage. But she, didn't, she wasn't in bondage anymore. She was doing it because she wanted to. In other words, her spirit was totally different. She didn't feel in bondage anymore. She was getting up early because she wanted to. She was cooking breakfast because she wanted to. She was cleaning the house because she loved her husband. She wanted to. She was doing all the same things because she's wanted to. Now, friend, that's the two ways to live the Christian life. You can live it in bondage or you can live it because you want to. Now, that's really the power of liberty. The power of liberty is the power to do the right thing because you want to. Now, the, um, the thing that's helpful with this is Jesus is trying to help us understand something. Now, I remember when I was in Bible college that 
that guys would talk about, guys would you come up with excuses why they could break the rules. Now, I went to a Bible college at the time, was a very conservative Bible college, had a lot of rules. It was kind of known for rules. It was kind of known for teaching uh, discipline in the, in the kids' lives. And so um, sometimes you'd have guys who would break the rules and they say, well, you know, I really didn't break the rules. Yeah, sure, I broke the rule, but I was really in the spirit of the rule. Have you ever heard people talk the spirit of the law? Well, I'm keeping the spirit of the law. I might not be keeping the letter of the law, but I'm keeping the spirit of the law. Do you know there's a serious fallacy with that? Because the spirit of the law is above the letter of the law. Now, Jesus illustrates this in the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount. You familiar with the Sermon on the Mount? He said, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, that's the letter of the law. Don't commit adultery. I preached on this to the, the high schoolers in the college age a week ago. He said, don't commit adultery. But he says, but I say unto you, this is what Jesus said, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the letter of the law is don't commit adultery. The spirit of the law is don't even think about it. So which one's higher? Well, we all know what it is, the spirit of the law. Not the letter of the law. What Jesus was saying is, hey, if you follow the Holy Spirit, you're not even going to think about it. Because the Holy Spirit is, you ever notice the Holy Spirit's first name? Have you ever called his first name? He's the Holy Spirit. Maybe we call him the pure spirit. See, the spirit of the law is always above the law. How about this one? Uh, also in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said by of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, uh, thou shalt not uh, uh, murder, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, and he goes on to talk about malice and anger that comes out in words, thou fool, and, and uh, those kind of raka and all those kind of things. And so I want to ask you a question. Which one's, high, which one's higher? Okay, the letter of the law is don't kill. The spirit of the law is don't ever say anything that would hurt somebody. Which one's higher? Well, we all know it. The spirit of the law is higher. Now, notice what it says in verse number 18, because we need to get this down. So when Galatians is hitting the law, what it's saying is actually something that is really freeing. Look at verse number 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So if you're following the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law. You say, oh, preacher, good, I don't have to obey the law. No, 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 no. When you're following the Holy Spirit, you're always way above the law. You're clearly not committing adultery because you're not even thinking about it. And you're clearly not murdering people because you, you're, not even, you're not even saying or ha using unkind actions or words toward anybody. Are you catching where I'm coming from? The Holy Spirit will always lead you to be above where the law is. So that's the power of Galatians. It's the power of liberty. Um, years ago, I remember singing a song, Free from the Law, oh, Happy Condition. And sometimes, you know how Bible college students are, they can be irreverent at times. And they changed the words of that. Free from the law, happy condition, now I can sin with Jesus' permission. Do you know that? They were, jo they were joking, obviously. But that's not what it means to be free from the law. Now, I believe today one of the things that separates conservative churches from broader evangelicalism is the point I'm making. Freedom from the law for them seems to be sometimes lower than the, the law, okay? But that's not what the Bible is saying. It's, it's above the law. In other words, it's like this, friends. People that follow the Holy Spirit will follow holiness because they want to. <laughs> See, that's being led of the Spirit. Now, what, what does it mean here? Because what are we talking about liberty? Now, the opposite of liberty is what we might call law-based or performance-based Christianity. So you, you, sometimes when I'm talking about, I'm, not, I'm against performance-based Christianity. I am against law-based Christianity because Galatianism is. Now, that doesn't mean I'm against holiness because when you follow the Holy Spirit, you'll be above the law. Every command of God you'll keep because you want to. But when you get into performance-based or law-based Christianity, you are absolutely heading for disaster. Why? Because I don't want you to miss this. The law provokes now, if you don't believe that, let me prove it to you this way. Let's imagine that you come back tonight, and there's a sign on that wall that says, wet paint, do not touch. Now, that's the law. I mean, that's the law. Wet paint, do not touch. 
and you go by that wall. Have you ever gone by a wall that says wet paint do not touch? What? Let's be honest. There's nobody here but us, so let's be honest. How many of you walk by that wall and want to touch the wall? Yeah, I'm telling you, I do. Don't ask me why. I can walk by a wall a million times. Could care less about touching it, but you put a sign on it that says wet paint do not touch. I'm looking at that wall. It's dry. It's got to be dry. I'm sure it's dry. Right? You ever gone by a well manicured lawn? I've noticed around here you got a lot of those. I don't know what the deal is. I mean, you ever go down south? Well manicured is not even in the vocabulary. But anyway, uh, there's you know a redneck. You ever been by a redneck's place? I mean, they got every car they've ever owned is in the in the in the in the, in the uh, front yard. Okay, haven't seen that in Oregon. I don't know why you don't have front uh, old cars in your yards. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, you ever gone by a well manicured lawn? You know, walking down the street and there's a nice sign air put out there and it says keep off. And you're thinking, the audacity to tell me a total stranger what to do or not do. Now, let's just be honest. In your carnal nature, okay, we'll put it there, in your flesh, what do you want to do to you, to the neighbor you never met in your life? You want to go by and go like this, step on his grass and keep going. Why? Because the law provokes you to want to break it. Have you ever noticed that? So we all understand that dynamic. See, one of the things you'll learn in parenting, and I think some of you are learning this, the goal in parenting is to, for your kids to obey you because they want to. And I realize that takes a lifetime. That's where the power of love comes in that we talked about on Wednesday night. But the power of liberty is being free. It's being free from that provocation, free from the law. So there's a desire and a power in your heart and life to want to follow Jesus. You want to do what he wants you to do. It's not a constraint. Now, we've talked a little bit about this. Now, what I'd like us to do then is go back to the big book of first part of Galatians, and we're going to have, I'm going to preach the rest of the time here on what we might call the symptoms of performance-based Christianity. So in other words, if you're, you're uh, in the idea of performance-based, okay, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this, and you're doing it, uh, and we're going to show you what performance-based Christianity is, I'm going to give you some symptoms to show I'm in performance-based Christianity, which would then mean that you're not being led of the Spirit. Because you won't, if you're being led of the Spirit, living your Christian life, you will not have any of the symptoms of performance-based Christianity. And so uh, performance-based Christianity is what we might call box-checking Christianity. Now, again, remember, if you follow the Holy Spirit, you're going to do the right things. It's not that we're out there doing, uh, we'll talk about this in a, a little bit later down the aisle when we get to one of the points. It's not that we're just doing what we want to do. It's not that we're indulging the flesh. We see that in chapter 5 here in just a moment. In fact, uh, but anyway, we'll, we won't go there right now. We'll go there later on. But here in the book of Galatians, I want you to uh, just, we just want to give you a little idea of what performance-based Christianity is. Now, first thing I want you to understand is, let's go actually to chapter 2, look at verse number 16. Chapter 2, look at verse number 16, a well-known verse. And I want us to just read it and then make a couple of comments here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And not by the works of the law, by the, by, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, anybody in this room, how many in this room were ever in a works-based religion? In other words, it was like this. If you do this, this, and this, you'll go to heaven. In other words, their, their whole idea of eternal life sin, and getting to heaven had to do with stuff you had to do. Would you raise your hand? Anybody in, in a works, performance-based religion? Okay, not a lot of you are. Uh, there are people out there today that it's like this. There's two kinds. When it comes to going to heaven, there's two ways to approach it. Number one, uh, it's... It's do, 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 do. Number two, it's done. Or we could put it this way. The Christian life could be, or, or uh, Christianity, uh, the, the false and the, and the true could be divided into two categories. It could be try, 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 or trust, trust, trust. In other words, friends, every performance-based salvation of any errant doctrine has, always has a list. Now, the list may be different, but it always has a list. Now, Judaism had fallen into that trap. And so here's the Apostle Paul, of course. Uh, he's dealing with that particularly in different books, but he, he comes back to the theme here. You're justified, you're saved, how? By faith, not by the works of the law. 
Now, I'm going to read something written by a guy by the name of A.T. Robertson, and I find this very, very helpful. It's uh, Paul's use of, and it's the word translated justified or justification. Paul's use of, and it's also in Greek, looks almost like the same word righteousness. It comes from the same root word, and of course, justification is being declared to be righteous. Paul uses this word uh, in two senses. Number one, justification on the basis of what Christ has done and obtained by faith. Thus we are set right with God. Number two, don't miss this, sanctification, actual goodness, practical righteousness, I would call it, as the result of living with and for Christ. The same plan exists for Jew and Gentile. So I want to go back to verse number 16, and I'm going to read it and substitute the word sanctified instead of justified. Because I believe A.T. Robertson's right that in that word justified, sometimes it's not talking about salvation, it's talking about the Christian life. And I believe he's right that both nuances are in verse number 16. So let's just put the other nuance in. We're not trying to do damage to anybody in inspiration. We're just kind of going to use that word to help us understand that justification can be talking about practical righteousness. We call it sanctification. Okay, here it is. Knowing that a man is not sanctified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be sanctified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be sanctified. In other words, friends, you don't grow in your Christian life by through flesh effort keeping, keeping the rules. Now I'll show you one other thing here that might be helpful as we kind of wind this together. Look at verse number 2 of chapter number 3. Verse number 2 of chapter number 3. And there's a series of questions here and the Apostle Paul is trying to get the Galatians. He's arguing, they, you see, they got saved right. I'm assuming most of you in this room, you got saved right. You say, how do you get saved right? You get saved by trusting Jesus to do everything you could never do. We talked about that on Friday night. And you get saved by realizing, I can't do any of it. I'm trusting Jesus to do all of it. Okay. So uh, let's, he's arguing from their salvation to their sanctification. In other words, the apostles say, listen, you got saved right. What happened? In other words, you got saved by faith. But now that you're saved, what are you done? You basically looked up and say, okay, God, I'm going to try as hard as I can to live the Christian life. And he says, it's not going to work. Okay, so let's look at verses 2 and 3. Look what it says. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? I'm going to ask him to go back and read that again. I want you to look at the question and I want you to answer it. Okay, would you answer the Apostle Paul's question? Here it is. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Boy, I, you're not very convincing. Let's try it again. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Boy, I thought I was going to have to change the message right here. Okay, yeah. You heard and you believed. Now I want to tell you something, friends. One of the joys I, that God has given us the privilege of is being involved in a ministry where we give the gospel a lot. And come this fall, uh, I will uh, preach, I'll uh, probably preach 30, uh, 30 some times, uh, preach the gospel, and there will be unsaved teenagers in the room. And I have learned something. The gospel is powerful. In other words, when I come into a week, I've done this for 38 years. When I come into a week of ministry, knowing we'll have rally nights where unsaved kids will be there, I never think to myself, I wonder if somebody will get saved this week. Because for 38 years, every time I've preached a three rally night, every, every week, somebody's gotten saved for 38 years. There's never been one week where kids didn't get saved. Now, that's no pat on my back. That's a pat on the back of the pack that gospel's power. See, the gospel, when it's got to be heard. People are not impacted by a gospel they never heard. Have you ever noticed that? But if you hear the gospel, the Bible says hearing of faith is somebody hears it and they believe it. I tell people the gospel is not even fair. You know what I'm talking about? Like if you go fishing, you know, sometimes we use the fishing analogy. If you go fishing, you throw a stick of dynamite into the lake and all the dead fish come to the top and you scoop them off the talk. That's not even fair. But I kind of view the gospel that way. It's like a stick of dynamite. It's power. But it's got to be heard. So the Bible says, how did you receive the Spirit? In other words, how did the Holy Spirit walk into your life in the very first place? And the point is you heard the gospel and you believed. Next question, verse number three. Are you so foolish? Don't answer that one. That might be embarrassing for some of you. Okay, next one. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Now I want you to answer that question. I want you to think about it. I'm going to ask it again. 
Now, Paul's going somewhere. He's arguing from their salvation. They got saved by hearing and believing. So he's going to ask, he's asking a follow-up question. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And the answer is yes or no? No. So here's the point. Performance-based Christianity is flesh-dependent. Remember when we talked about 0, 100? What puts you on the slopes of defeat? Any amount of flesh dependence puts you on the slopes of defeat. What does it take for somebody who wants to get saved not to get saved? How much self-dependence? Remember we talked about that on Friday night? So how much self-dependence can a seeking sinner have and he can't get saved? Too much self-dependence. And the answer is any amount. Any amount at all. So how much self-dependence can a seeking saint have who's sick of defeat and wants victory and wants to get some sin out of his life? How much self-dependence can a seeking saint have before he won't have victory? And the answer is? The answer is? Yeah, he can't have any. See, the thing I want you to see, that's what the Apostle Paul's saying. Having begun in the Spirit, you, you got saved by trusting God to do a miracle. He said, having begun by faith, are you now made perfect by flesh dependence? You haven't become by depending on, having begun by depending on Jesus, uh, are you now made perfect by depending on yourself? And the answer is no. We're not made, we're not, we don't grow spiritually. We don't become complete in our Christian life by flesh dependence. So here it is. When I say the symptoms of performance-based Christianity, really what I'm saying is the symptoms of flesh-dependent Christianity.